Hello and welcome to my channel and if you're not new here, that's not what I meant to say at all. I fucking botched that three seconds in. Hello and welcome to my channel if you're- <laughs> Compose yourself. Hello and welcome to my channel and if you've been here already, welcome back. I hope you've had another really good, productive, fun-filled week. I myself have have had a productive week. I don't know if I'd go as far as fun filled. I've just been working, working, working. And then all the times in between, like the evenings and stuff, I'm doing stuff for TikTok, I'm doing stuff for YouTube. I don't think I've had an actual like day off in weeks and weeks. <laughs> I'm very busy, but that's okay. It's a bit of a shock to the system for somebody who is as naturally lazy as me, but it's fine. So today we're going to be talking about Peter Connolly, who was better known in the media as Baby P. As with most of my cases, there's two elements to this. There is the abuse and the murder itself, and there is the repercussions of that, the alleged failings of social work and professional agencies that were involved in Peter's care. I just want to put as a little side note and for clarity for anybody who doesn't know anything about this case he was referred to as baby p in the media throughout the whole of the trial and it wasn't until afterwards that his name was released as peter connolly but essentially in the simplest of terms what we talk about when we're saying that the social services and the other professionals that were relevant to peter's care failed him we mean that there were ample opportunities to save him, to intervene, to implement child protection methods to keep him safe and prevent this from happening essentially. I also just want to give a quick disclaimer at the start of this video I suppose. Most people will know as I said before what the baby P case is about, what it entails but just in case you don't know it's important to remember that all the true crime cases I cover contain very sensitive potentially upsetting information but this one in particular does detail the abuse and ultimate death of a child. I would say I've become quite desensitised to things like this, doing this all the time but even for me researching this case was difficult reading the details of this case was extremely upsetting so just bear that in mind and if things like this really really genuinely do upset you then please don't watch this video it's definitely not for you but I'll be back next week with something different so with all that being said let's just get into it this is the case of Peter Connolly. Peter Connolly was born to his mum Tracy Connolly and his father on the 1st of March 2006. Now Peter's dad has cropped up in the media from time to time since this case has been you know publicised so Peter's mum Tracy grew up in Islington in North London and she had a very troubled childhood to be honest with you. Her mother had problems with drink and drugs and Tracy herself was sent to boarding school at a very young age in her early teenage years. This is where by the age of 16 she got all her qualifications and she went on to meet a man who was 17 years older than her. This man of course was KC, baby Peter's dad and Tracy actually lied to him about her age so that the two of them could engage in a relationship together. So the two of them began a relationship and actually had three children before the birth of baby Peter. So when baby Peter was born on the first of March 2006 he was their fourth child but the family of six didn't last long as when Peter was only three months old his dad actually left based on allegations that Tracy was having an affair with another man and the family was then torn apart. Peter was just three months old when this happened. So around five months after the departure of Peter's biological father, Tracy actually moved in her new boyfriend. So Peter was about eight months old at this point. Her boyfriend's name was Stephen Barker and at this point the family were living in a house in Tottenham. Tracy didn't really tell anybody about Stephen moving into the house and this would become a bit of an issue and one of the more controversial parts of this case later on but we'll get into that when the time comes. So by the point that Stephen Barker moved into the family home, he and Tracy had already been dating for a few months. The way the timeline adds up, Tracy pretty much began dating Stephen as soon as Peter's biological father left. So Stephen Barker was a nasty piece of work from his very, very early years of childhood. He was said to have a morbid fascination with pain and suffering and from a very young child would torture very small animals. We're talking like guinea pigs and frogs are what have been specifically mentioned. When he was a child he skinned a guinea pig alive and he ripped the legs off a frog while it was still alive. Stephen Barker had an older brother called Jason Barker and Jason was very much said to have dominated the two brothers. He was actually quite mean to Stephen. He was constantly somebody who would taunt him. He had a special nickname for him which was Fat Boy. He generally just used to make Stephen feel so inferior. A report on the BBC highlighted that Jason and Stephen when they had both been younger actually physically attacked attack their 82 year old grandmother. This was a very brutal attack intended to make their grandmother change her will so that everything was left to the two brothers. There was also another incident later on when the boys were still young but a little bit older that they broke into their grandmother's bungalow and 
locked her inside her wardrobe. This attack served no purpose, this was intended purely to scare her. Stephen Barker grew up to be a very burly man of around six foot four. He was a big guy. However, he was described by people who knew him as simple and he was unable to read or write. When he moved in with Tracy Connolly in 2006, he was unemployed. Alongside his obsession and fascination with pain and suffering, Stephen also had an unhealthy fascination with the Nazis. He brought loads of Nazi memorabilia with him when he moved into Tracy Connolly's house, including knives that had swastikas on them. Why, as Tracy Connolly, you would think it was remotely acceptable to invite somebody like this to live in a house where your children stay, I will never know. Speaking of Tracy Connolly's house, it was an absolute tip when it was searched by police after the incident, which I promise I will get to very soon. There was faeces found on the floor of the property, which when tested was found to be that of a dog and a human being. There were dead baby chicks, dead mice and a dead dismembered rabbit also found within the property. Now remember that Stephen as a child liked to torture small animals. I'm sure it's not difficult to decipher what had happened to that rabbit and who had been responsible for it. There were also holes in the walls of all of the rooms in the property where rats were burrowing inside. The house was just absolutely disgusting and this is where Tracy lived quite happily and would sleep in every single day until after lunchtime. The reason that Tracy would sleep in so late is because she would be up till all hours on her computer either playing online poker or speaking to people in online chat rooms. When she would wake up at lunchtime she would then just move from her bed to her sofa and lie there all day smoking cigarettes inside the house. Again, that place must have just smelt horrific. Like, I can't even imagine. Cigarettes, dead decomposing animals. Like, rats were burying their way into this house from the outside and we know what kind of environments that rats typically like. Like, sewers. As well as the fact that there was actual shit on the floor. Like, there were kids being brought up in this place. So while Tracy Connolly was either sleeping or lying around on the sofa or on the computer, Stephen Barker was predominantly left in charge of looking after baby Peter Connolly. I should also add as well, because I don't think that I've said it yet, at this time Stephen was 31 years old and Tracy herself was 26. So by this point we know that Stephen Barker was the one who was predominantly left in charge of baby Peter and we know from everything that was reported in the media that a lot if not all of baby Peter's injuries were inflicted by Stephen. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through a timeline of all the incidents that occurred between Stephen moving into the property and baby Peter's unfortunate death. So Stephen Barker moved into the family home in November of 2006 and by December 2006, baby Peter was already being noted by a GP to have bruising all over his face and chest. Now at this point, nobody was aware that Stephen Barker was living in the house. Tracy kept this a secret from everyone, even her own mother. Mother, Peter's grandmother wasn't really sure what was going on between the two of them. So when these bruises were spotted, Tracy Connolly was arrested because she hadn't told anybody else that anyone was responsible for looking after her son except her. Tracy's mother would later say that she knew nothing about Stephen Barker and as the two of them, Tracy and Stephen, became closer, she was increasingly shut out of the family. So the GP made a referral to social work after seeing the bruising on Peter's body and an initial child protection case conference was held. So an initial child protection case conference is something that results from an initial referral being made. So in this case, the referral was the GP flagging this to social work. So the way that these meetings work is that professionals from different agencies will come together to discuss and review their reports that they have submitted for the individual in question. Sometimes it's a child, which is child protection. Sometimes it's an adult, a vulnerable adult. These agencies will just be any professional that is directly involved with the user of the service. So if we're talking about a child, you typically have people from health. So you could have a GP, a school nurse, a regular nurse, a midwife if the child is young enough. If the child's a wee bit older, you might have somebody from education, such as a school or a nursery teacher. The police are also always involved, as well as sometimes you get addictions workers if the parents are struggling with alcohol or drugs problems. It really just depends on the circumstance and what sort of professionals the families are getting support from already. If the family, so that is the child or the parents or both aren't getting a certain level of support that they need in one specific area, then referrals will be made and the family will really have to adhere to this if they want any hope of keeping or getting back their child in this case from social services. So at these child protection case conferences, basically all the reports are discussed, the child's circumstances are discussed and the professionals have to decide together 
whether or not the child's name will be placed on the child protection register. That was the shittest explanation of anything. So an initial child protection case conference was held for baby Peter, although the GP who raised the alarm in the first place didn't attend this and didn't provide a report for this, which you would always ask for a GP's report for a case conference. At this point, Peter Connolly's name was added to the child protection register. However, with this only having been one incident of bruising, it was agreed that there was a strong likelihood that Peter was just an accident prone, active little boy. So while Tracy Connolly was in prison, a senior social worker actually advised that Peter be placed into the foster care system. I guess that she just had a little bit more of a gut instinct that something wasn't right here, but she was overruled and Peter was just sent to live with family friends for five weeks. In January, Tracy was released from prison and Peter Connolly returned to her care and unbeknownst to any professionals, also the care of Stephen Barker. So because of the area in which the Connollys lived, all of this child protection, etc., lived under the Haringey Council. In February 2007, a former social worker who had worked under Haringey Council actually wrote a letter of complaint saying that they just weren't very efficient. There was a lot of ignorance of cases, there was a lot of negligence. She said that cases would often pile high on people's desks, they would often be ignored, that the staff were checking all of the right boxes without actually implementing the correct procedures in their practical work. Basically that social services at that time within Haringey Council were made to look a lot better on paper than they actually were. One month after this letter was received, the Commission for Social Care Inspectors met to discuss it but nothing ever came of it. This was alarm bells being raised for how Haringey Council social work was failing to deal with cases as they should be. This was an alert raised to this a month after Peter's first sign of injury and it was completely ignored. This social worker had been talking about it on a more general level but of course it would later be very very relevant as this council's social work team completely failed Peter Connolly. In April 2007, Peter was admitted to hospital again, this time with bruising all over his body, two black eyes and swelling on the left side of his head. Again, this was another opportunity missed for a professional to assess this boy and see that something sinister was going on here. The way that social workers work is they will do announced and unannounced visits and announced visits obviously give any family that has serious problems an opportunity to hide things that they don't want being seen by social work but in an unannounced visit they can't really do any of that and in May 2007 Peter's social worker made an unannounced visit in which she saw marks on the boy's face. Tracy Connolly was then re-arrested. Upon further inspection it wasn't just marks on Peter's face he actually had 12 areas of bruising on his whole body. Remember this is a one and a half year old boy he is absolutely tiny. He had 12 areas of bruising on his body as well as scratches. But still, nobody knows that Stephen Barker even exists, much less that he is the one that is constantly caring for Peter. But Tracy Connolly was released from prison again and in June 2007, Stephen Barker's older brother Jason, who I had mentioned before, attacked his granny with him. His older brother Jason moved into the house with his 15 year old girlfriend. Jason was 35 at this point. So Jason Barker is Stephen Barker's older brother and he was from Bromley in London. He is a father to four children and in the aftermath of the Baby P trial he changed his surname from Barker to Owen and became Jason Owen. This was an attempt to disguise his identity so that nobody would know who he was. So the reason for him and his girlfriend moving in to Tracy Connolly's home is because he was on the run from his wife because he was obviously having an affair with this child. Various reports have also stated that Jason actually dug a hole in the back garden of Tracy Connolly's house stating that that was where he could hide his 15 year old girlfriend if police ever came to the door. During the five weeks in which Jason stayed in the house with Stephen, Tracy and baby Peter, Peter's injuries became significantly worse. Jason at the very minimum did nothing to stop the abuse that Stephen was inflicting upon baby Peter and it was reported as well that he would laugh whenever Stephen harmed the baby. So obviously I had mentioned earlier that Jason was the more dominant out of him and Stephen so I honestly think that given the evidence, the fact that Jason would laugh when Stephen harms baby Peter was kind of Stephen's way of showing his older brother that he wasn't to be underestimated and treated the way that Jason had treated him for his whole life. You know, Jason had constantly undermined him. Remember, I said that he called him things like fat boy. He completely just taunted him his whole life and made him feel really, really inferior. I just think that this in conjunction with the fact that Stephen was making Jason laugh by abusing Peter, as well as the fact that Peter's injuries got significantly worse at this time, 
goes to show that he was trying to impress his older brother and show him the things that he was really capable of. Show him that he wasn't to be messed with, he wasn't just Jason's little brother that he could pick on and call him horrible names. You know, he could actually be this big hard man probably in his eyes that could inflict such horrible things on a baby. Of course, you and I know that a man inflicting any sort of pain on a woman, child or animal does not make him a man in any way, shape or form. It makes them much more of a coward, if anything else, but I just don't think, based on what we know about these two men, this is how they will have seen it. I think they will have been relishing in the fact that they could really, really harm this boy and seeing it as very masculine. So the abuse inflicted on baby Peter continued for the five weeks that Jason was living in the home, very much at the hands of Stephen Barker while mother Tracy just slept on the couch. At the end of July 2007, social work made another visit. This one was actually announced so the family had time to prepare. Baby Peter had injuries on his face, very visible injuries, and his hands, and he was actually deliberately smeared with chocolate to hide these. And this worked. The social worker did not notice these injuries. She just thought he'd been a happy little boy that was munching away on some chocolate and got himself in a bit of a mess. She had no idea of the sinister motive that was behind the chocolate on his face. On the 1st of August 2007, Peter was examined one last time by the Child Development Clinic. There is a lot of evidence to highly suggest that during this assessment really, really bad injuries were missed such as broken ribs, potentially even a broken back. How something like a broken back could have been missed during a child development assessment? I have no idea. But this would be the last ever time that baby Peter was seen by a professional, the last opportunity for intervention and again, like all the other times, it wasn't taken. The next day, on the 2nd of August, Tracy was told by police that she would not be prosecuted after her case had been considered by the Crown Prosecution Court. The next day, on the 3rd of August 2007, baby Peter was found at 11.30am unresponsive in his cot. Emergency services were called to the scene and they reported that this little baby was lying in his cot blue. Emergency services did all they could and baby Peter was rushed to the hospital but tragically he was pronounced dead on arrival. So I'm just going to read some of the injuries to you now that were found during the autopsy of Peter Connolly and again this is really really upsetting so just bear that in mind. Feel free to skip ahead if you don't want to hear any of this. So baby Peter's injuries included but were not limited to a broken back, missing skin from his nose and mouth area, blackened fingernails and toenails from bruising. He actually had one fingernail and one toenail that had been deliberately pulled off as well. He had a torn ear that was becoming detached from his head at the bottom. Bruises, bites, cuts and scrapes all over his body. It's not actually been confirmed whether these were human bites or dog bites. The skin that was attaching his top lip to his top gum was completely ripped and he had a missing tooth which was later found in his stomach suggesting that he had been knocked with such force that this tooth had went straight to the back of his throat and he had swallowed it. Later that same day, Jason and Stephen were seen on CCTV taking a walk in a local cemetery with a plastic bin liner. This bag is thought to have contained Peter's blood-stained clothing, but it was never found despite the police conducting various searches. On the 11th of November 2008, Stephen and Jason were found guilty by a jury of causing or allowing the death of a child or vulnerable person. Tracy did not need to be trialed before a jury because she had already pleaded guilty to this offence. In terms of the charge of actual murder, Tracy and Jason were cleared of this due to insufficient evidence. During his trial for the murder of Peter Connolly, it was found that Stephen Barker had repeatedly shaken and punched Peter. He would also often swing him around by his legs and attempt to make him fall off furniture such as sofas and chairs and he would spin him round and round on computer chairs until he fell off. Stephen would also attempt to train baby Peter with various commands just like a dog. So like when Stephen clicked his fingers, Peter would would stop whatever he was doing and touch his head to the floor. Failure to do so would result in punishment so Peter very quickly learned to be responsive to Stephen's commands. Tracy Connolly was told that she would serve at least five years in prison and she's actually still there now so she's done a lot longer than five years but and I will come back to this later, it is at the news in the moment that she is looking to be released very, very soon. Stephen Barker was given a minimum of 12 years for causing or allowing the death of baby Peter, but he actually remains in prison now because it came out not long after baby P's trial that he was guilty of the rape of a two-year-old girl. He was sentenced for that on top of his sentence for what he did to baby P, which 12 years 
for killing an infant, I just think that's absolutely ridiculous. But he is facing those sentences one on top of the other, so he is still in prison. However, even for the rape of a two-year-old girl, he only got an additional 10 years. And Jason was jailed as well, and he was told he would have to serve a minimum of three years in prison. I believe he's out now. So in the weeks that followed this case, a number of professionals that had been directly involved with the care of baby Peter resigned or were sacked. Four social workers in total were sacked by Haringey Council, one of which actually had to go into hiding not long after the trial because she was getting death threats from the public. So like I said, it is in the news now that Tracy Connolly is set to be released from prison very, very soon. We're talking as soon as the next few weeks. If she is released, Tracy Connolly will be subject to restrictions such as where she can go, who she can see, what activities she can engage in. She will not just have a free reign over what she does. So who is to blame for all of this? Obviously, aside from Tracy, Stephen and Jason, what professionals are liable for the death of this little boy? Social work received the most stick from anybody, even though I disagree with that. I'm not saying they shouldn't be held accountable because they absolutely should, but it wasn't just social work that was involved with this little boy. That's not how these things work. Peter was also seen by GPs and other healthcare professionals. Being a social worker comes with a huge responsibility. In many instances, social workers have pressure set upon them to totally transform dysfunctional families. Care plans for vulnerable children are intended to be the least restrictive that they possibly can be, offering help and support to families whilst trying to keep their lives as normal as possible in the hopes that issues are ironed out. You know, parents seek support for their own demons and improvements are made accordingly to the children's lives. At Child Protection Case Conference, social workers work in conjunction with other agencies. It's a multi-agency approach. This involves any agency that may be relevant to supporting the parent and or the child in a case. I don't think social work are solely to blame here. Like a number of other agencies should have acted on what they were seeing happening to Baby P and should have intervened. They had the same opportunity to intervene, but they still didn't. It was also not the first time that a child has been let down by the social services of Haringey Council as seven years prior to this, eight-year-old Victoria Columbia died as a result of abuse. Victoria Columbia had also been known to professionals in Haringey Council and she still wasn't saved. So that is everything from me on the case of baby Peter. I remember this happening. I remember reading about it in newspapers. Specifically, I read about this case when I was 11 years old in a newspaper in a hairdresser and I was absolutely shocked to my core. I remember they printed a CGI picture of a baby's head. It wasn't Peter's head specifically and this detailed all the injuries that Peter was found to have when he had passed away. And this picture was everywhere. I'm sure if you remember this case, you will remember this image like it was yesterday. It is just an absolutely heartbreaking case made all that more sad by the fact that it definitely could have been prevented. He was a beautiful, beautiful little boy and he wasn't given a chance in life at all. This didn't need to happen and it very much still goes on to this day in this country. While I do completely understand the pressure and the responsibility that is put on our social workers, I think more should have been done. Baby Peter was visited over 60 times in his short life by professionals and not one of these times did somebody think to raise the alarm. It also came out later that in the minutes of case conferences and in a recorded interview between the police and Tracy Connolly that Stephen Barker's name was actually mentioned. Haringey Council tried to deny that they ever had knowledge of this man, but this evidence obviously suggests otherwise. So when this man's full Christian name came up in both case conferences and police interviews, why was it not looked into? Why was he not looked into? There was just so much that could have been done that wasn't. And this case had this entire country up in arms. It was an absolute frenzy and rightly so. And that little boy never even got a chance. So that's everything from me this week. There is a crow looking at me from above my window and it's just staring into my soul. This week's case was a very hard hitting one, so go and make yourself a cup of tea. Go and watch something a little bit more light hearted now. Please leave your thoughts below in the comments. I love reading them, I love replying to them, and like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I will see you all next week. Goodbye! I don't have an outro song, so just have me singing instead.